M friends, I haven't built every Tamiya armor kit in existence, but this one is the best I've had the pleasure to work on. One of the most iconic tanks in existence, in my opinion more fabulous than the Tiger, and it's recreated in 1 5th scale in the beautiful Tamiya standard. Well, in fact, I'd say it goes above and beyond Tamiya standards. How do I know all of this? Well, because I've already built one six years ago, pretty much immediately after it landed in my local hobby shop, and it was an amazing experience. Finally being able to build a beautiful replica of this tank in one weekend, and then just having fun with the weathering glory fest. I have lots of good memories of this model, so I hope I'll make some new ones with this build. It comes with a lot of good stuff, although some features, such as the silly motor, are completely pointless to me. I didn't need it back then, and I sure won't be needing it now, because I'll put the tank in a diorama. Also, these kits have become pretty rare on the market these days, so I'll make sure to make the best out of it. Uh, well, yeah, let's begin. Even though I built one already, it was a long time ago, so it didn't help me build the model without instructions or anything, but at least I already knew which parts should be slightly improved. A huge part of this model can be reworked if you want a 100% in-scale ultra-realistic replica, but as is often the case, I like to compromise. Let's instead focus on the more interesting aspects of the build, such as gluing the doors open. <laughs> But seriously, it's good to follow the instructions because the hull is assembled in a very specific way. Because I wanted to leave a few hatches open, it was a good idea to paint the interior black. This way I won't have to deal with it later using an airbrush. Also, as you've already figured out from the thumbnail of this video, I'm building a knocked out tank. And this will expose a few areas that would otherwise be hidden. Ejector pin marks are easily filled with a combination of black superglue and CA filler powder, and the excess can be quickly scraped and sanded away. The really interesting part of this build is the shrapnel damage. It looks completely different than shell impacts on heavy World War II tanks. I'm not building a specific vehicle, so I took inspiration from a few different tanks, and to start things off, I marked out the shape of the impact. The thin armor used to crack and shatter, and most importantly, it was very thin. So it's important to remove the excess material from the other side. Then I could chop out the basic shape of the hull, this could be done with a hobby blade as well, and trim it exactly to my liking. This is a good opportunity to also adjust the thickness of the steel plates. Another nice detail is the missing rivets that would just fly off into the void. This was pretty common on these tanks, even if they didn't get destroyed in combat, and it's a quick and easy way to add more character to your World War I model. In fact, the scariest part about this whole process is mustering up the courage to actually damage such a beautiful kit. Because my model will be sunken in a shell crater, I won't be needing all the road wheels. But because I wasn't sure how many of them will be actually visible, I glued at least a few, because once you attach the sides of the hull, you're not getting there again. Most of this work was done by the book, but now we can tread off the beaten path, so to say. The kit was expecting me to use the motorized running gear, but that was simply never an option on this project. Luckily, you can find the proper plastic wheels on the spruce, but you have to look for them because they're not mentioned in the instructions. What I couldn't find were properly sized axles for them, and the only way I was able to hold them in place was by using the power of modeling cement, super glue, and friendship. <laughs> the gun barrels don't have any seam line down the middle, which is super impressive. Way easier to clean around the muzzle. And in fact, the cannons are very well detailed. Sadly, none of this will be visible in the end. The only place where filling was needed was the mantlet, and because I had the putty at hand, I also added some very subtle steel texture to make it look a little bit different from the rest of the tank. Let me show you something else. There are lots of vision slots on World War I tanks, and these are usually molded in a closed position. Not all of them need to be closed or open, so an easy way to add more character to the model is by milling out the thick plastic and then carefully opening the slot with the hobby blade. The sponsons click nicely in place because they're meant to be removable for that whole electric motor thing, and note how I omitted the machine guns, as these were the first thing to be scavenged from a destroyed tank. 
Okay, so now I'm at a similar stage with the other tank, but this is the moment where things take a turn. <laughs> My inspirational photo for this project is this Mark IV female, and to make the model sunken in a diorama, I'll have to cut it in half. <laughs> Here's a simple contraption to place the model under the desired angle. Here's a baking pan where I'll put the contraption. This is how I'll superglue the tank to the baking pan. And here's a bottle of water and some unnecessary paint. Yep, I'm gonna make colored water and use it to mark the water line. Well, <laughs> would you look at that? Two liters wasn't enough. Okay, another concoction and this is finally getting me where I want it to be. Except... Um, now I don't know how to remove the model safely. Huh. Oh well. Let's just send it. And would you look at that. It didn't leave any mark at all. Okay. Huh. Plan B. Another contraption. And one extra contraption with a sharpie. And hey, it doesn't work bad at all. <laughs> Thank you kind strangers on the model ship building forms. I mean, the hull is quite complicated, but it works well enough to give me a good idea about the cut. It probably wouldn't cut it if this was a waterline ship model, but with armor, anything goes. <laughs> okay, surgery time. I'm cutting it purposely a few millimeters below the waterline, so I can smooth it out later with sandpaper. A rotary tool works really well for this task, except for one thing. There's a lot of material inside of the hull, and a circular cutter like this can't go through all of that. An empty ship hull or a more traditional shaped tank with an empty lower hull would be much easier to cut. But hey, at least I made the cut on the outside. For the rest of the tank, a hacksaw with a blade for cutting middle will, I think it will suffice. This was even more painful than destroying all the beautiful detail on the outside with the rotary tool. And none of it felt right, even for one second. But hey, as long as it will help me achieve my goals, then it's the right path, correct? <laughs> anyway, here's what I ended up with. Sucks to be me, because I don't have any large sheets of coarse sandpaper, and I definitely don't have a belt sander. So, I guess this will have to do. But as I said, you can hide anything if you're an hour modeler. So let's move on to something more pleasant. The tracks are a highlight of this kit. They just click together and you can assemble an entire run in less than 10 minutes. I was completely blown away by this six years ago, and it felt even more amazing because I was experiencing this beauty after building several World War I kits from MHR with their horrible, thick, rubber ugly tracks. Anyway, I won't be needing complete runs on either side, and I can actually make them look meaner with these grouser spots from Freel Model. They assemble just like on the real thing, and it's a great piece of aftermarket if you like World War I armor, because they'll last you for a whole bunch of Mark IVs. Another way to add some character to this tank is by adding a thermal wrap around the exhaust. This was pretty common because stowage and soldiers riding on top of the thing could easily get burnt, and it also means you don't have to clean any seam lines. So, an absolute win. The Tamiya-ness of this kit becomes apparent when you want to expose parts that would otherwise be hidden. The TACOM kits are well detailed in this region, and sadly I didn't have any suitable L-shaped plastic profiles for these details, so a simple half pipe will have to do. There's also a lot of rivet detail missing under the tracks, but luckily this simple life hack makes the process so easy and fun that you could make a new hobby out of it. A piece of tin foil, the blunt end of a drill bit, and a piece of rubber. Quick, perfect rivets. And what makes the process even more enjoyable, they can be glued to the model using modeling cement. It's just way easier than using super glue, and they hold in place pretty well. I guess it's because they sink into the softened plastic, and that's all they need to stay in place. Well, that concludes the Mark IV. It's in a pretty sorry state, just as I am at the moment, and <laughs> that's actually pretty sweet when you can relate to your own creation, right? Anyway, let's put all of this aside and build a diorama for it. The figure from Black Dog has a beautiful pose that fits my plans perfectly, 
but the sculpting is a bit rough in places, and the seam lines are also huge. But honestly, at least they're easier to spot. What makes this figure so awesome is the club on his shoulder, and I made it even more serious by adding a bit of barbed wire. The figure is also pretty tall, but hey, not all men are 5'10 in real life, and again, it'll fit the scene perfectly. As for the diorama itself, as always, I started with the general dimensions, trying to make the scene as compact as possible without making it feel claustrophobic. This expanded bubble styrene is ideal for basic shapes, because it's useless for anything else, so you won't feel sorry if things don't work out immediately. This was the case here, and I didn't like the composition at all, so I started with a new slab where I marked out the terrain features before actually cutting it to size. This way I had a much better idea about the finished scene, and I also decided to break the rules a little and make one of the shorter sides the main viewing angle. Then I made the raised portions from another type of foam. This one is actually sold in sheets by AK, and it's ideal for creating terrain features because it's easier to cut with a knife, and you can slowly build up the groundwork from several floors, so to say. Yup, this does indeed look pretty alright so far. Which means I can laminate the sides with planks of balsa wood. I should finally look for some better materials because balsa is not ideal by a long shot, but at the same time I've gotten pretty used to its properties. I left everything pinned for a few hours so the glue would completely solidify, and I also made the diorama taller to give the scene more vertical volume. Then I could trim the sides, remove the excess from the top, and fill all gaps and holes with acrylic putty for wood. This time I didn't cover everything with the putty, which would actually give the sides a beautiful smooth look. Instead, I'm going for a more greedy textured surface. Simply because I didn't want to do the extra work, which is okay I guess, if you don't feel it, just don't do it. The wood also tends to soak up spilled paint and whatnot, so I made sure to make it less spongy with two or three layers of diluted PVA glue. This also locks all dust particles in place and makes the surface overall much cleaner. And now for the actual groundwork. I was given this super light, super fluffy acrylic putty to try out, and I already love it. It's like foam, and it beats air drying clay on every front. I was expecting it to work perfectly for this scene because of the flooded crater that makes up the majority of the diorama. As you can already tell, I'm not gonna show its full depth, just a few millimeters. So I need a perfectly smooth bottom. It's very easy to spread and dries for a pretty long time, and what's best, I can sink the tank into it without creating a huge mess everywhere. It doesn't stick to the model, so I don't have to clean the tank too much, and it's super soft, so I can press the model into the putty all the way down to the styrofoam. It'll be easy to remove for painting and weathering, and I'll be able to put it back in the exact spot where I wanted it in the first place. Not to mention it hides most of the ugly cuts I made, and the putty can be smoothened out even further with a brush and some water. I think it could be used for some interesting ground texture because it's naturally so fluffy, but it needs some elbow grease to stick properly to styrofoam. Now I could make my traditional muddy paste from PVA glue, and some earth, lots of different sized stones, and that's actually it. I went for a much more textured mixture this time, that's the reason for so many stones. Well, all I ended up with was a paste that was hard to spread because the rocks were few and far between, but no worries friends, because after all, it's just a sticky compound that allows us to add more texture if desired. My aim for this terrain was very loose, textured and crumbly. I saw it in my inspirational photo, and it's typical look for excavated or thrown up dirt. After all, it's no man's land, so there was plenty of that. Interestingly, the groundwork doesn't seem too muddy, and that's another amazing opportunity to add different color gradients once I start airbrushing and weathering the groundwork. This also meant I didn't have to bother too much with soldier's footprints, because if this ridge was frequented a lot, the ground would be pretty hard packed. Let's now make a blown up tree from a broken twig. Actually, that's all you need, and some two component epoxy putty for good measure. 
The tweak is there for the general shape, volume and realistic broken wood. The putty is there for bark texture and it's a very straightforward process. It's just better to let the bark harden overnight because you can easily leave some undesired fingerprints in the putty. Next up, some scattered stowage. These are flimsy cans that I made some time ago for my 148 skill Crusader and they fit perfectly in a World War 1 scenario as well. The files are available on my Patreon if anyone's interested, but I wanted to add that I'm just so happy with them. My first print was on the old Photon and they were... Um, passable. But this time, when I printed them on a properly calibrated Mono SE, they're just beautiful. Some of them will be floating in water and I already can't wait to get to that point. I also used some items from the plastic figures that came with the kit. I think these will add to that gloomy battlefield vibe but won't be too graphic. Another detail observed in the photo is a few wooden poles. I think these were meant for barbed wire, but I don't see any in the picture. Besides, there were more dedicated tools for that, but again, they'll make the scene busier. And speaking of those more dedicated tools, here I'm making a simple bending jig for the exact purpose. Naturally, I watched the movie 1917 when I was making this diorama, and these pigtail anchor points were a pretty common sight on the battlefield. One takes a minute and a half to make, so after a while you'll end up with enough to liven up your battlefield scene. I'll add the barbed wire later, because it'll be pretty hard to paint every little detail glued in place. So yeah, <laughs> I think that settles things for this evening. My friends, if you've been watching me for a while, you must have noticed a different approach with this project. Instead of finishing the model first and then giving it a diorama, I did it all in one go. For starters, it would be very odd to slice a model in half and then start painting it without any context. And second, a model that's basically a part of the scenery just allows you to build the entire diorama around it. It also gives you more time and space to focus on composition, details and so on, but that's just my feeling and everyone can have it differently. It sure does look odd without any paint, or the most important aspect, water in the shell crater, but we'll get there, we'll get there for sure. So the next part will be about painting, probably just with an airbrush because there's a lot of ground to cover, figuratively and literally. And I can already tell it'll be a lot of fun because I might be able to compose the entire scene with colors. I want to go for a pretty grim, gloomy look, so we'll see how that turns out. Anyway, until then I want to say thank you for watching, thank you for your support, because the last few weeks were pretty tough for me. Uh, you know, just a lot of personal issues and everything, but you guys and gals always brighten up my day, so thank you. And also, thank you to my wonderful patrons who make this show possible. Yeah, I'm gonna do my usual Patreon plug now, so if you want to support me and in return get some access to something like a Night Shift blog or a magazine subscription, then that's the place to go. I'm posting almost every day with updates and deep thoughts from my workbench. We can get in touch through DMs, comments and emails. You can watch videos one week early without any ads. You can get access to 3D files if you have a printer. You can download these beautiful studio pictures in full resolution. And last but not least, some ideas and references for dioramas, sceneries and buildings. Yeah, so with that out of the way, it's now time for me to sign off and start painting this diorama. I hope I'll see you in the next installment and until then stay safe, stay awesome, build those models, don't just collect them and I'll see you again soon in the next one. <laughs> Cheers!